Well, uh, my name is Samora. If you've never met me before, my name is Samora. I'm one of the pastors here at Eastside. And I'm just, I'm so grateful to be here with you this morning. Uh, but before we get into, you know, the message for today, um, as we know that, um, you know, the church is not just this place in the corner of Premier and Hosfontein. The church is all over the world. And this morning we have some friends of Eastside uh, from Crossroads Church. Can you guys stand up? Where are they? Can we give them a round of applause as they stand up? I'm going to invite them up here. I'm going to invite them up here. Can you guys come up here? I'm going to invite them up here. Um, they come from Crossroads Church, uh, which is a, uh, a friend of Eastside. This is TJ, Jake, Janet, Robert, and Caleb. Um, and they've come here this week to be a part of uh, an initiative of Abba's Pride. And uh, Josh, where's Josh? Is Josh in here in this room? There he is. Josh is in the back there. Um, over the last couple of years, we've decided that we, we work with all these churches in, in the cities uh, around Pretoria, these under-resourced churches. Uh, but what we want to do really is to begin to develop leaders who are going to be able to, t- to take part in what God is doing in the communities. And so there's students from all of these churches that come to, to, to Eastside um, this week in March, every year, or the last two years, Josh. Yeah, the last two years. We've been bringing them to Eastside, and for four days, we do our best to make sure that they have fun and that we pour into them and into their leadership. And a couple of years ago, um, Crossroads Church decided that they wanted to partner with us. And so every year since, they've been sending a team of people to come and help with that program and assist with that program. And uh, these guys are going to be here the whole week. They're going to be ministering to kids. You know, they're going to be uh, breaking up fights. All the stuff that goes on with youths is going to be happening this week. And so we just want to pray for them spe- uh, specifically right now. And I want to ask Josh to join me up here. Josh, can you come up here for a sec? Just bring Bailey. Bring Bailey along. Let's give Josh a round of applause as he comes up. And so we just want to commission them in the work that they're going to be doing. The Abbott's Pride team is going to be with them as well. It's going to be a wonderful time. And so if you're off this week and you have some time, please... Send us a message, fill out the connect card and tell me I'd like to serve. There's lots of things that you can do here during the week. Or you can just pop by. There's lots of stuff to do even then. But I just want to pray for them uh, as they get into ministry this week. And we pray that God will set you apart and that this will be uh, a a moment that will not only mark your lives, but will mark the lives of teenagers who come in and be a part of this program this week. So we pray together, church. Uh, Could you just stretch your hands towards them just as a sign of that we're, we're with them. Jesus. We thank you for your global church. We we thank you for the ways that we get to partner with you. And I pray for these guys who are coming into ministry this week, Lord Jesus, that you would protect them in their hearts and in their minds. Pray that you would anoint them specifically for this moment. Pray, Lord, that every, every single obstacle that they face, Lord, you would give them wisdom to be able to navigate. Pray, Lord, that you would keep them in their health, Jesus that they will remain healthy and strong. Pray that you would, you would help them in those moments where it seems like they've not had enough sleep and there's just lots of stuff going on, that peace would flood their hearts, Jesus. Pray for Josh as he, as he leads this endeavor this week, Lord Jesus. I pray for a special anointing over him. Pray for the whole Abba's Pride team who are going to gather around him and rally around them as he leads this. Pray, Lord, that you, this will be a special time. This will be a seed that is planted. And if we don't even see the, 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 the fruits of it just now, but it will be a seed that will last into the future. Protect them, Jesus. Be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give them a round of applause. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Well, good morning. Once again, you guys are seeing a lot of me. I got a lot of air time this morning. Um, but let's, this is our last week of our vision series. We've been walking through the book of John chapter 4 over the last few weeks. And this is going to be the, the final sermon in that series. But, um, excuse me. If you guys will allow me, I'd like for us to read the scripture together. And as you sit there, if you have your Bible, I want you to just flip your Bible open to John chapter 4 and just kind of track with me. We're going to have it on the screen, but I, as I read, I just want you to, to center yourself into immerse yourself in the moment of the scripture and to what's going on. So this is how it goes. This is, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Uh, John chapter 4. Jesus knew the Pharisees 
had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please, give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. Now the woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said. And this this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're, the, you're greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than what he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Verse 13, Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I will give them will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, said the woman, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come back to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. And Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband. For you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You have certainly spoken the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet, so tell me. Why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshipped? Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship while we Jews know all about him. For salvation comes to the Jews. But the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now. When true worshipers will worship the Father in in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming. The one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Just then, his disciples came back and they were shocked to find him talking to a woman. But none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village, telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food that you know nothing about. Did someone bring him food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. Then Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from the will, from doing the will of, the, of, of God who sent me and from finishing his work. You know the saying, Four months between planting and harvest. But I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages. And the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. You know the saying, one plants and another harvests. And it's true. I sent you to harvest where you did not plant. Others had already done the work and now you will get to gather the harvest. Verse 39. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus 
because the woman had said, he told me everything I did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in the vill- for him to stay in the village. And so he stayed for two days and said to the woman, now we believe, not because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. Now, over the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at a, at, a, at a couple of different things. And if we can just have that up on the screen. Just one side, let's go. So over the last couple of weeks, we have been trying to re-emphasize our vision uh, as a church. And who can just shout out what our vision is? Anyone can shout it out? What is the, what is the vision of each side? I'll give you a clue. To bring... Yeah, there we go. Well done to the three people in this room. But that is, that is the vision of Eastside, is to bring hope and salvation. And this year, we're trying to focus, our senior pastor, Pastor Rian, on Vision Sunday, spoke about the vision. And he added a phrase into it that we just want to zero in on this year as well. We bring hope and salvation, but we also want to mobilize people. Meaning, we want people to gather around the vision of bringing hope and salvation. And so as we close off the last couple, the last week of our sermon series together, we want to talk about discipleship a little bit. Now, I just want to say up front, I'm not going to say everything you want me to say about discipleship, but please forgive me, because I just want to highlight a few specific areas that I think are very helpful for us. So I want you to imagine that you're, you're in the middle, right? You have a, a piece of paper on your chair, um, our reach cards. They, they, they illustrate a very similar dynamic. I, I as Samora, I'm in the middle of this process, because this is a process at the end of the day. It is an outward-facing process, meaning I am doing it for others, right? So when I, when I invest, I'm investing in other people. When I invite, I'm inviting others into the story. When I share the story of Jesus, I'm doing it for others. And when, I, when, I come into, when I'm being discipled, I am the one who's facing that process. So I connect, I invest, I invite, and I share, and I disciple, and I am involved in the entire process, right? Now, I want you to think about your own journey of faith. The reason you are now a Christian is because someone got you into this cycle. Maybe someone invited you, you were were campus ministries, you were uh, a student and the greatest heathen and someone invited you to a campus ministry and that changed your life. So an invitation changed your life. You accepted the invitation of a friend to attend a church event and it changed your life. Maybe you you weren't a Christian for many years. But someone wasn't giving up on you. They continued to invest in you. Or maybe there was a time in your life when you were lonely and someone was connecting with you. See, what we're trying to do is we're trying to build a framework here of how the Christian life is supposed to be lived. The Christian life is not lived for ourselves. The end of being Christians is not that we would go to heaven and like really have a great time with God. But Jesus is inviting us into a journey of becoming like him so that we would teach others to become like him, which is the process of discipleship. Here, I'll visualize it another way. Here, I'm kind of trying to to build the steps of what's going on, like we're going deeper at each level. So in week one, we talked about connection, and connections usually are very surface level, like I'll say, hi, how are you doing? We might chat a little bit about the weather or whatever, and that's where we go. But as as time goes on, as as I start to build into a relationship, I begin to go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into that relationship. So I invest, and then I invite someone to be a part of something. And it's like we're we're going deeper into these different layers of relationship. But eventually we get to discipleship, which in this process, discipleship then becomes the lifelong journey of a Christian. So once all of this has happened... The next part that comes in is discipleship. So I am, as Samora, as a Christian, I am being discipled, but I am also discipling others. So I've been invited into the journey so that I can go out and invite others into the journey as well. When I was young, I was actually talking about this earlier, but someone laughed at me. When I was young, can you, do you have that picture up there? Uh, this is a picture of me. I think I was like, I don't know how old I was. I was trying to find a picture of me and my sister together when we were young. And this is the best I could do. But it doesn't represent the age range I'm trying to talk about. But when I was about 10 years old, I was obsessed with wrestling. Like, I wanted to be in the WWE so bad. 
Anyone else was obsessed with wrestling, or is that like not a thing anymore? Yeah, there we go. I got some hands on the tech desk. But I was obsessed. I wanted to be in the WWE so bad. And so what my sister and I would do, and my sister, I told my sister I was telling this story, and she wasn't happy. But uh, what we would do is we would get, if you've ever seen a, a, a carton of eggs, a 30 eggs, it's got like a little cardboard box that comes with it. That was our prized possession because when my mom bought the eggs, we'd take the cardboard box off. And then we would like put the egg somewhere else. And then we would, we would cut out like a WWE championship belt out of the cardboard box, right? And we would just, we would wrestle each other. We would cry when we wouldn't watch WrestleMania because my mom was like, we got to go to church. It's, it's playing on Sunday morning. You are not going to stay to watch wrestling. We're going to go to church. And we would just be like mad the whole day. But it, eventually that had to come to an end because my, like I was like elbowing my sister on the bed and like jumping on her. And then my mother was like, all right, we're going to cut this off now. This is not going to go on any further. But I, I, Triple H was my favorite wrestler. I loved him. Like he used to do the thing with his water when he walked. Anyone watch wrestling? I feel like this is not connecting. It's not connecting the way I thought it would connect. But I would watch wrestling and, and he would do the thing with his water. Where he'd have, and the water would like splat. And I was like, oh man, that's so cool. I want to do that. I want to be exactly like that guy, right? The point of the story is this. Is whatever I am focused on, I begin to become like. So whatever we're focused on is the thing that begins to reflect us. So if my focus is to become like Triple H, then I'm going to start like, I'll get this water bottle and I'll, and I'll just do it right now, right? That's the, that's the kind of thing that's going to happen. So whatever is our, fo- our attention is on is what we end up becoming like. So I want you to just take a moment. What's the f- like when, when you're just sitting around, what, what comes up to the top of your mind? Like what's the first thing that you think about? Because there's things in our lives that hold our attention and we begin to become like the things that hold our attention. So as a believer, I want to become more like Jesus so that I can become, so I want to, to have my attention on Jesus so that I can become like Jesus. So personally for me, the process of discipleship is I watch what Jesus does so I can begin to do what Jesus does. Right, that's the invitation that Jesus has right here. Um, let's look at this verse quickly. In, in Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30, it says, Then Jesus said, Come to me, invitation, all of you who are weary and, heavy, and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Listen to this, it's very important. Let me teach you. So when Jesus invites you to come to him, he is inviting you so that you become a student. In fact, the original meaning of when we talk about disciples, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about apprentices, someone who's sitting under teaching. So when Jesus invites you to come and follow him, he's inviting you so that he can teach you something. He's invited you to come to church. Yes, this is, the, this is a, a big part of our formation. But more than anything, Jesus says, I want to teach you something. And he goes on, he says, because I am, je- I am humble and gentle in heart. And this is the promise that he gives. He says, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. I love this, uh, the, this definition of discipleship from, you know, what, one of the most important thinkers I think ever, uh, Dallas Willard. He wrote the book, The Divine Conspiracy. And this is how he explains discipleship quickly. He says, a disciple or an apprentice, which is a better word, is simply someone who has decided to be with another person under appropriate conditions in order to become capable of doing what that person does or to become what that person is. So discipleship means I want to be capable of doing what Jesus did and becoming like Jesus was. In plain English, discipleship is is accepting the invitation that that Jesus gives us to become more like him. But he doesn't give us the invitation to become more like him so that we would be better than everyone else. He gives us the invitation to become more like him so we might also teach others to become like him. So in this process of discipleship, as I am being discipled, I am, I am becoming like Jesus is so that I would be able to teach others to fall into the same rhythms that Jesus is in. And I want to just draw a few points, even from our story, 
uh, about discipleship and about this process that's happening. And the first one is this, is that discipleship is designed to move us from being curious to being convinced. Because we see in the story that often the woman shares her story, the woman shares her story with the entire community. And everyone is like, yes, we believe this Jesus that you're, talking, you're telling us about. And they begin to, to start to believe in him. But then it doesn't end there. They don't end just by saying, hey, that was a great story you told them. We believe that story that you told us. When they meet with Jesus, verse 40, it says, when they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe not just because you have told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. And so Jesus has an initial experience with them and everyone is curious and everyone is saying, hey, we believe this message you're telling us. But then Jesus, he loves this crowd so much. He loves this village so much. He says, hey, I'm not going to just, I'm not going to leave you right now at this initial moment. I'm going to spend some time with you. It says that he stayed in the village two more days. Remember, that was, in, that was not in his original plan. But Jesus allowed himself to be available to the people so that he could move them along in their journey. And you, do you see, do you notice what they say after Jesus leaves? They say, now, it's no longer because you told me that I believe. Now, I, it's been confirmed. I've moved from just being curious and just being on the periphery to believing for myself because something has happened in that process. And some of us, we've moved to that. You were once just on the sidelines of church, you're not sure what's going on, like, I don't want to. And now you're like a, you are gung-ho for Jesus. But it's because something has happened that's moved you from that moment and moved you deeper into a relationship with Jesus. Now, we see here that Jesus stays only for two days. Now, discipleship isn't a two-day process, but because Jesus is Jesus, I mean, he can do anything. But for us... This is a process that takes weeks, months, years, and dare I say, your entire life becomes a process of discipleship. So as we, I just want you to imagine back the, the, the different phases that we move through. We begin to move through all those phases, but the, the phase that we stay with the longest is the discipleship phase. So I can connect with someone, I can invite them, I can invest in them, I can share the story of Jesus with them, they accept Jesus, great. Then the rest of their lives, the rest of that moment means I need to stick with them, and I need to teach them how to become like Jesus because I am also becoming like Jesus. Does that make sense? And listen to what, listen what it says here. In, this, in the, the, village, the village that believed the testimony of the woman was at first curious. But God loves the people of that village so much that he gives them himself. So because God loved the people of that village so much, he doesn't just say, hey, the message is enough. But he says, I'm going to give you my time. And I'm going to spend time with you. Now, the next thing I want to highlight is this. We've talked about discipleship moving us from curiosity. Moving us from curiosity to being convinced of the message. But another thing that discipleship does is discipleship moves us to the next level. Right? So many of all of us are at different points in our journey with Jesus. And it does not, we are not moving at the same pace of maturity. We're not moving at the same pace of understanding. But Jesus has all of us on a journey taking us somewhere. So discipleship means then, it, whatever level I'm at, there is always another level of, of intimacy. There is always another level of depth that I'm able to get to that I need to move from where I am into a greater level. So when I finished four years at, at uh, uh, the Baptist Theological Seminary, I didn't reach like, completion. I was like, all right, I've, I know it all. No one needs to teach me anything ever again because now I've, I have my honors degree and I have everything I know. That's not how it is. Because to be with Jesus means he is always inviting us to more depth. And so wherever I am right now, Jesus is inviting us to go even deeper. In fact, there's a, there's a very beautiful um, parallel that happens in this, in this story. Now, we know that the story focuses on the woman, right? The interaction between Jesus and the woman, because that's a primary interaction. But I want you to just take a look. Just step back for a second 
and see how the story of the woman parallels the story of the, of the disciples in the same story. Because Jesus is walking two journeys, is, is walking two journeys with two different sets of people who each are at different places in their journey. So we have the woman who's at the first stage. She's at connecting. She, no one's connected with her yet. And Jesus is initiating that. But the disciples, they're kind of advanced. They're, they've moved past that. They've connected. Now they're, they're established. They're following. They've given up their old jobs. And they're moving with Jesus. They're following Jesus. But Jesus takes them on the journey that parallels the same journey of the woman. Because we see that the woman goes to the well to find water. But the disciples, they leave the well because they're going to find food in the village. The woman is fixated on getting physical water, and they were fixated on being able to find food. And Jesus draws the attention of the woman to the thirst to, to uh, of, uh, I'm sorry. Jesus draws attention to, to the woman's thirst to teach her about living water and true worship in the Messiah. At the same time, Jesus uses the disciples' fixation on food to teach them about a brand new kind of food. God's work and their mission. Now when the woman leaves the well, she's full of living water and she goes to share into the city. The disciples, they return from the city empty-handed except for the food that they bought. But Jesus is bringing both of them into a deeper recognition of where they are. So when we talk about discipleship, we're talking about recognizing where we are and moving even deeper than where we are. So Jesus does exactly the same thing. If you guys can go to verse 34 for me. Verse 31. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Jesus here is, de is demonstrating very practically what it means to disciple. He's, he's helping his disciples who are already committed to learning from him to go deeper in their understanding. At the same time, he's bringing the woman into the process. That's what he said. That's why he says to them, they ask him, they say, Rabbi, please eat something. And Jesus' answer is kind of very funny to me. He says, I have a kind of food that you know nothing about. They ask themselves, did someone bring him food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. So their understanding was past that of the woman, but they weren't there yet. So Jesus is moving them right along because their minds are still fixated on the food. And Jesus says, hey, let me, let me teach you something right now. He says, you're thinking about the food that you want to eat physically. But he says, I have, my food is to do my father's work. By extension, he is teaching the disciples the very same thing. He's saying to them, my food is my father's work. Your food should become the work of the father. Because you are following in my footsteps and becoming like me. So God is moving us to a deeper level. I'm running out of time here, so I'll just move on to the, to the last one. This is the last one. Discipleship moves us to disciple others. So as we go, go through the process of discipleship ourselves, we ought to bring others along in the process of discipleship. As we learn how to become like Jesus, we ourselves are bringing some people along so they are able to learn how to become like Jesus. Listen, if it were not for this exact process, I would not be standing on the stage today. There are some people who they connected with me, they invited me, they invested in me, they shared the story of Jesus with me, but then they didn't say, okay, cool, you're a Christian now, let me find someone else. No, no. Once that whole process had happened, they said, all right, so more now you've become a Christian, you're a new creation, God has forgiven all of your sins, but now let's help you understand what it means to walk with Jesus. One particular person I think of all the time is my principal, when I was still living in the Eastern Cape, my high school principal who helped me like figure out the opportunity to go to the United States. He was such a type, uh, he was such a man for me. He decided that actually it's more, I'm going to walk a journey with you. And you know that sometimes people don't, don't realize that they need to walk a journey. And so you might not start by saying I'm discipling you, but when you open up your life to them to be able to see how you live, you begin to open yourself up to a journey with that person. And my principal did that. Every time, I, every time I'd be home, he would invite me to his house. 
He would take me to all of his, uh, all the places he was preaching. He would bring me into meetings I had no business being in. But all that time, he was beginning to walk a journey with me. And as I watched him live out the life of Jesus, I began to think to myself, whoa, man, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still pretty early at this. I need, to, I need to begin to catch up. I need to begin to live in that same way and to live into the life of Jesus. So discipleship isn't just for us. It moves us that we would also begin to disciple other people. A.W. Tozer says this. It's, I think it's a great line. He says, only a disciple can make disciples. So a disciple goes on to make disciples. So the process cannot be shortcut. You can't, you can't circumvent it. You yourself must be a disciple in order to make other disciples. You must be a disciple. Now, I just want to, I want to point out a couple of examples that I think are very beautiful because we see the Apostle Paul do this with, with Timothy. He meets this young guy and he says, hey, I'm going to bring you along on these journeys that I'm going on and I'm going to show you some things. And he writes a, in, in, first, in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 68, he says, This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift of God. The spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power and self-love, uh, and self of love and self-discipline. So never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord Jesus Christ. And do not be ashamed of me either, even though I am in prison for him, with the strength God gives you. Be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. So the Apostle Paul has a history with Timothy. He's invited Timothy to see his life. And eventually he recalls this moment where he lays hands on him. Because he's walked this journey with him and he says, you are being called to something else. And you go do it. But now because we've been on this journey together, when I write to you, I'm able to point to our shared history. And say, remember that moment that we had together? I love this one, especially 1 Corinthians 4 verse 17. That's why I have sent my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. This is a very powerful line. He says, he will remind you of how I follow Christ Jesus. Just as I teach in all the churches wherever I go. The question is, is how, does, how would Timothy know how Paul follows Christ Jesus? It's because you saw him follow Christ Jesus. And from seeing the Apostle Paul walk in the journey of God, he says, I've taught you everything I can. I'm sending you off to the churches. And when you get there, the same way that you watch me follow Jesus is the same way that they are going to watch you follow Jesus. And you're going to continue the process of discipleship, and you're going to multiply. Church, this is the whole point of, of, of us meeting together like this is that as we follow Jesus, we bring some people along to follow Jesus. And so I want to close this. I want to put some handles on this. Just give it a, a, a more practical step than where I'm at right now. Here's two things I want us to, to take away from this. The first one is this, is we, we really need to figure out the answer to this question. I went through all of the stages. I've been invited. I've shared, like, I'm a Christian now. But where am I on the journey of following Jesus? I accepted Jesus, but I haven't read my Bible in three months. Yours is, your, your next step is very simple. Can, can someone tell me what the next step is? Yeah, pick up the Bible. Thanks, TJ. Your next step is pick up the Bible. Maybe you say, yeah, I'm somewhere, I read my, I've read the Bible every year since I got saved. And I've been saved for 10 years. So I've read the Bible through 10 years. And so reading your Bible might not be your next step. But yeah, when I read my Bible, I never pray. So what's your next step? Your next step is to go into prayer. So what I'm trying to say is I want you to take a moment, just, just sit down with yourself and say, where am I on the journey? Jesus has called me. Jesus has, has brought me out and, and I'm, you know, I'm saved. But I'm never at church. You know what your next step is? is start coming to church. But for some of us, we might be farther along in the journey. 
And we need to get even deeper and deeper and deeper in that journey. But figuring out where we are is where we need to go. Before we can do anything else, we need to figure where we are on the journey so we can see where we still need to be discipled. And if you're here and you don't even follow Jesus, this morning I, wanna, I just want you to know that Jesus is inviting you into a journey as well. And maybe you don't, like, you don't understand the Bible, you don't, you don't understand everything about Christianity just yet. But I want you to understand this, that Jesus is offering you the adventure of a lifetime. And all you need to do is to say yes to that adventure so you begin to walk a journey with him. Now, this is, this is inward focusing, but I want to I shift it a little bit to an outward focus. Now, I've tried to, to have three different steps. So discipleship is moving us from a group setting, right? Like, there's, there's a ton of people in this room. And this is part of our formation. This is a kind of discipleship that's happening right now because we're digging into the word together. But discipleship and the way that Jesus did it, Jesus, he would speak to the large crowds, but then eventually he would move the conversations to smaller groups. So he wouldn't just stick at the crowd, but he would move to show exactly what was happening beyond that. And he would pick out a few guys and he would say, these are the people that I'm going to be walking with. For some of us here, man, we, we know so much about Jesus, but no one is learning from us. What would it look like for you to say, hey, I'm, I'm available, and I'm not just going to wait till someone asks me, but I'm going to look out for some young guys here, and I'm going to invite them on a journey. And I'm going to take them deeper than where they're at. This is what's helped me. The people in this room right now who I didn't ask, but they, were, hey, they said, hey, Let's get breakfast. Let's get coffee. Let's sit down. And without me even knowing it, I began to walk a journey deeper into my faith. And maybe there's some of you here who can do that. And so there's, there's three ways I just wanted to highlight. Can we go there quickly? So people are at different phases of this journey. And so we ask ourselves these questions. How can I pe- help people to accept the invitation to follow? If they're not Christians, they can't be disciples. Right? Discipleship is the deeper journey that we, 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 we enter into once we've said yes to Jesus. It's a whole life journey. The next phase is we have to be intentional in their forming. So once they follow Jesus, they are in a process of formation. They're beginning to understand the, the, the way to live a Christian life. They begin to read that reading the Bible is important, that prayer is important. All of those things are happening. And then the last step is once they're being formed, we teach them how to fish. We say, hey. You go out there now and you, and you repeat the same process. And you do what I've done for you for others. And so this piece of paper that we've been putting out every single week is meant as a way for you to visualize how to actually go out and begin to disciple other people. So when you look at it, it's not that, you know, we just don't want to print a ton of paper, but it's for your uh, convenience that when you look at it, you'll be able to see this is where I need to go. But this is how I'm supposed to move on from where I'm at. And those eight people, I hope you've, you've written down as many names as you can. And you're beginning to think, man, some of these people are far along in the journey. How can, I, how can I move towards discipleship? How can I move them towards discipleship? And so as we end this journey, church, our encouragement is that you would not keep. Christianity is, God is not looking for secret agents. Like people are living in the world and no one knows you're a Christian and you're like kind of ducking and diving any religious questions. God is looking for people who are going to go out there and they're going to proclaim the message of Jesus. And he's called each and every single one of you to go and do just that. So please don't leave. If you don't have that piece of paper, don't leave without that card. Take it home, put it on your fridge, put it in your car, put it in your back pocket, whatever you have to do. So you can take it out and you can remember the names of some people who you need to take on a journey. And begin to take them on that journey. Because God is calling each one of us to move along. He's calling each one of us to move on this journey. And so I'm going to pray for us now. And we're, we're going to end our, our time together. Jesus, I just want to thank you for the time that you've given us. Pray, Lord, that you'd help us to begin to help others become like you. Just as we become like you. Jesus, we know that the the journey of discipleship is a long road. And some of us have been Christians for 20 years, and we are still going deeper in our relationship with you. 
Some of us have been, been Christians for a few months or a few weeks. But Jesus, you are inviting us into a deeper relationship with you. And there's some of us in this room who don't know you, Jesus, and have never accepted the invitation. I pray, Lord, that this morning, Holy Spirit, you would do something so miraculous in their hearts. That they would feel the invitation to a journey with you on the inside. So we thank you for our time together, Jesus. Bless us as we leave. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, church. We've come to the end of our service. We just have a few announcements before we, we rush out. Um, there's a couple of things that are happening. This week, this coming Sunday, is Easter. Yes. Easter is coming up this week, and so we have our Good Friday service uh, on the Friday at 9 a.m. We're going to have an early morning uh, service on the Sunday at 6 a.m., and then we're going to have our regular 9 a.m. service. After the 9 a.m. service, we're going to have an Easter egg hunt. We're going to be able to hang out. We'll have hot cross buns. We'll have coffee so we can hang out after the service. Don't rush off. Bring your whole family. Bring a picnic, lay out on the field. It'll be a wonderful time. We'd, like to, we'd love for you to be a part of that. And the little kiddos can go off and they can do the scavenger hunt um, uh, for Easter eggs after that. And we're also still asking for Easter egg donations. So if you haven't purchased a box of Easter egg, I think they're on special right now at the checkers here at Parkview. So after the service, you can leave, grab a box, you can bring it back here, you can, you know, we'll find a way to get it here. But please, we'd still love for you to donate some of those Easter eggs for us um, so that we can have a, a good time that Sunday. Uh, what's is there another, any other announcements? Two announcements, uh, we're good. All right. Um, other than that, guys, we would love to thank you for being here. We love you so much. Don't rush off. There's coffee. Uh, there's tea. There's good time. Say hi to someone that you've never said hi to before. If you are new, this is your first time at Eastside, we'd love to invite you to our guest area to learn more about Eastside and the community here. Other than that, we love you guys. Grace and peace to you all. Go out in power. In Jesus' name.